All right, well, I want to thank everybody for coming out. I am Dr. Jason Lyle. I'm a speaker and research scientist with Answers in Genesis. I want to show you today that when you look at the scientific evidence, it's consistent with what the Bible teaches. You see, a lot of people think that we try to prove the Bible using science. Well, we don't do that because, you see, the Bible ultimately is the authority. If you try to prove the Bible, that means something else is the authority because that's what you're using to prove the Bible. Now, we don't do that at Answers in Genesis, but what we do is we show you that when you understand the scientific evidence, it's consistent with what the Bible teaches. You see, we all have a way of looking at the world. We have a sort of mental glasses. And if you think about it, if, if, when you put on red glasses and you look around, you see red everywhere, don't you? It's not that the world is red, it's that you're looking at the world through red glasses, and that affects how you see things. And so we can ultimately look at the world either through what we call evolutionized glasses, which, and I don't necessarily mean that you believe in evolution, but maybe your way of thinking about things is based on man's opinion. Because as we saw previously, it's really about God's word versus man's opinion. Or we can ultimately look at the evidence through biblical glasses. Those are our choices. We can look at the universe through biblical glasses, God's word is truth, or evolutionized glasses, man determines truth. I like to think of the Bible like corrective lenses. Those of you that, that need glasses to see properly, you know that if you don't have those glasses on, the world looks kind of fuzzy, but you put those glasses on and things snap into focus. The Bible is like corrective lenses because it gives us the correct view of history. But ultimately, we can look at that evidence either from evolutionized standpoint, in which case we're thinking in terms of millions of years, of slow, gradual processes. We're thinking in terms of naturalism, that nature is what determines how the world got to be the way it is today. Or we can look at the universe through those biblical glasses, in which case we're thinking of biblical history. Now, the Bible talks about seven C's of history. You've, you've heard about the seven C's. Well, we've got seven words that start with the letter C. We've got creation, in which God created the heaven and the earth. He created a paradise for us to enjoy. But we ruined that paradise. That's corruption. We in Adam sinned. We rebelled against God, and that ruined that paradise that God created for us. Then we had catastrophe, Noah's flood. God judges sin. And he flooded that world and, because God is righteous. He has to judge sin. And confusion, the confusion of tongues of the Tower of Babel where God split up the people groups because they were, they were united in rebellion against him. And then Christ, God himself, steps into history and, and pays for the penalty of sin on the cross. And then finally, in the future, we will have consummation where we will have a new heavens and a new earth. Paradise lost will be paradise restored. Now, if we're looking at the universe through biblical glasses, we're thinking in terms of the true history that the Bible gives us, not millions of years of evolution, but thousands of years where God created and the world became cursed because of man's sin. Now, if you think about it, we can take a look at any evidence through either biblical or evolutionized glasses. Take canyons, for example. Uh, think, of, think of the Grand Canyon as one example of a, of a massive canyon. Evolutionists and creationists have the same Grand Canyon, don't we? And yet we interpret it differently. An evolutionist is thinking in terms of millions of years of slow, gradual processes. And he's looking at that Grand Canyon and thinking, boy, a little bit of uh, water over a long period of time could certainly make that canyon. Whereas a creationist is thinking in terms of biblical history. He's thinking in terms of the worldwide flood. The biblical creationist says, oh, look at that. A lot of water over a little bit of time could make that canyon. It's the same canyon, but because we have different views of history, we interpret it differently. And it's the same way with, with virtually any aspect of science. Creationists and evolutionists have the same evidence. We have the same science in the present, and we believe in the same ideas about gravity and, and light and things like that, science that we can test in the present, real operational, observational science. But we have different views of history. And so when it comes to reconstructing the past, creationists and evolutionists have different views. But what I want to show you today is that when you start from the Bible and you look at the evidence in the present, it's consistent. It makes sense. And it's not as consistent if you start from evolution. And I want to talk about several different fields of science, mainly three fields of science today. I'm going to talk about genetics, talk a little bit about information science, and then I'll talk about fossils, earth science, things like that, rocks and fossils. So let's start with genetics, which is the study of how traits are passed on. So my first question for you is, do animals change? Do dogs change, for example? Yeah, dogs change. What do dogs change into? Dogs. dogs. That's right. Dogs change into dogs. Now, that's not evolution. That's just dogs because you got the same Genesis kind. And that's what we'd expect on the basis of Scripture because the Bible says that animals reproduce after their kind. Everything reproduces after his kind, a, a phrase that's repeated ten times in Genesis 1. You see, evolution, though, according to evolution, there are no distinct kinds. We're all related. You're related to an onion, and if evolution is true, because we're all descended from this pond scum billions of years ago, and it branched out into all the different kinds of life. But according to creation, God made certain distinct kinds back at the beginning. Now, some of those have branched off into different varieties today, 
and sometimes even different species. By the way, that's not evolution, though, as we'll see, because they're the same genesis kind. They're the same kind of animal. Mosquitoes may be changing into a different species of mosquito. They're still mosquitoes. They're the same genesis kind. Now, a lot of times, evolutionists will misrepresent what creationists teach, and they'll say, oh, creationists don't believe in change. Well, wait a minute. I'm a creationist. I believe in change. I believe the world was once a paradise. Today, it's not. Things change. That's what the Bible teaches, you see. Of course things change. The question is what kinds of changes are possible. And a lot of times evolutionists will say, well, the creationists believe that, that God made all the species of Earth exactly as they are today. Well, now wait a minute. Now wait a minute. Not at all. These things have branched off in different varieties. Take poodles, for example. I can't believe that there would have been poodles around at creation because the world was very good when it was first created. It was a paradise. <laughs> so of course you're not going to have poodles in it. Not at all. Those are one of these, these branches off to the side, as we can see here. Now to understand how these, how these changes occur, we need to know a little bit about DNA. DNA is a very long molecule that exists in every cell of your body, and it looks something like a twisted ladder. And on the rungs of this ladder are little chemicals called nucleotide base pairs. There's four different kinds of them, and it's, it's kind of like a little four-letter alphabet. You can think of this as a, as a different language, but a language that only uses four letters. And you can actually spell out information in DNA if you wanted to. You could write a book in DNA if you wanted to. It's just a different language, in the same way that you can spell out help with beads on a rope in Morse code you could spell out information in DNA. And that is the mechanism that God has chosen to use to incorporate all the information that makes you. And that's a lot of information if you think about it. And the reason that you are a person and not a cabbage is because your DNA has the instructions to make a person and the cabbage has the instructions to make a cabbage, you see. It's really an amazing system. Now, to make things even more complicated, you have two sets of DNA. You get one set from dad, you get one set from mom. And it's actually the combination of those two sets that determines your various traits. And so you can have little differences. For example, differences in, in blood type. Here's how, how it works with blood type. And I find it interesting, too. You can have traits that neither of your parents have. For example, if dad has blood type A and mom has blood type B, you might have blood type O. It is possible. You still get the genes from your mom and dad. You still get O gene from, from mom and O gene from dad. But see, you have a different combination. And so because you have a unique combination of DNA, you have unique traits, unless you have an identical twin, in which case you have the same DNA. And it's those traits, those combinations of traits, that determine various features in human beings. For example, skin color. We basically are brown in color. Human beings are. It's just a question of how much brown do you have? How much melanin do you have? A couple different kinds of melanin. And if you have these more dominant genes, you tend to be very dark complected. And if you have the the uh, more recessive genes, you have these, this lighter combination. Adam and Eve probably had a middle brown combination. They wouldn't have both been light or both been dark because we're all descended from them. All the different people groups on Earth are descended from them. And so you can see how it works. If you, have this, if you start with this combination right here, you can actually get any different combination from them. And it's the same way with dogs, for example. The, the, w the way we have the different breeds of dogs are just various traits uh, surfacing because you have different combinations of genes. And so there's quite a lot of variation within the dog kind. Now they're all just dogs, but we would expect that variation based on how DNA works and based on the different combinations of DNA. And so this is how you get all these different breeds of dog and the same way with elephants, the way you get the different breeds of elephant, including kinds that have gone extinct, like the, like the mammoth. But here's, here's the point that I need you to understand. You see, an organism like an amoeba or a, or a bacterium, something like that that has that is uh, simpler than we are. And by the way, it's not simple. A bacterium is not simple. If you think it's simple, it's you build one. Hmm, they're quite complicated. But they're simpler than you are. They have fewer instructions in them because they're, they're not required to make things like eyeballs and hands. And you have those things in your DNA. So if you think about it, a horse is going to have greater instructions, more instructions in its DNA than an amoeba would, a single-celled organism would. If evolution is true, if we're descended from bacteria, that means that information has to increase. You see, if we're descended from bacterium and, they, and we have a lot more information, at some point that information had to increase. Evolution, and I'll say it one more time because it's so important, evolution is about an increase in information in your DNA. Now that's very important to understand because the processes that we observe in nature tend to decrease the information in your DNA. Even ones that evolutionists like to say are evolution, they're really, in a way, the opposite of evolution. And let me give you one example of that. Let's talk about natural selection. A lot of people use natural selection as an example of evolution, but really, in a way, it's the opposite of evolution. Let me show you why that, why that works. So suppose you had two dogs here, and they have a gene for long fur and a gene for short fur, and suppose those genes have a combined effect, which some genes do, and that would make the dogs have medium length fur. Gene for long, gene for short, so they have medium length fur. Now this, of course, is all simplified, but the basic genetic principles here are true. And so you start with these two dogs, 
and they have pups. Well, some pups are going to get the short gene from dad and the short gene from mom, and they're going to end up with short fur. Some dogs are going to get the long gene from dad, the short gene from mom. They're going to end up with medium length fur, the same as their parents. And some dogs will get long gene from dad and long gene from mom. They'll end up with long fur. Now suppose that there's an ice age. And suppose that ice age wipes out the dogs with the short fur and the medium length fur. Why? Because they're not as well insulated against the cold. And so the dogs that are better able to survive in that cold environment are the dogs that have the long fur. They go on and reproduce, and pretty soon all the dogs have long fur. These dogs can't reproduce because they're dead. Natural selection killed them off. Now this is a great example of natural selection because these dogs, they have, they've adapted to their environment. It's a great example of adaptation. And you can see why it is. that The environment got cold, the dogs had long fur. But the information was there from the beginning. These dogs had the information in them for that long fur. It just wasn't expressed because they had the wrong combination of genes. But you see, if you think about it, this really is an evolution. Because have we gained any information? Not at all. In fact, we've actually lost information. Putting it this way, if there's now a heat wave, we're now down here, all the dogs have long fur, there's now a heat wave, are those dogs ever going to go back to having short or medium length fur? Not at all. Because they don't have the information. They've lost the information for short fur. That gene has been eliminated from them. Natural selection actually reduces information. Adaptation reduces information. In a way, it's the opposite of evolution because evolution, we said, is about increasing information. This is the exact opposite. Let's suppose you had two dogs on Noah's Ark and they get off and get married and have kids and their kids get married and have kids and so on and they have lots of pups and some of those go off north and some of them go south. Some of them places, go places where it's cold. Some of them go places where it's hot and they adapt to their environment by natural selection killing off the dogs that have genes inappropriate to that environment. But it's not evolution. You got dogs changing into dogs. That's not evolution. It's just dogs. And of course, it's not an increase in information. There's no evolution here at all. It's just natural selection. And of course, that's a creationist concept anyway. Edward Blythe wrote about natural selection long before Darwin came up with the, the idea of, of uh, evolution, or at least popularized the idea of evolution. And so the way you end up with all these different breeds of wild dogs is just natural selection acting on the genes that God created in the dog kind. Natural selection tends to select the dogs appropriate to their environment. Okay, but what about mutations? Well, a mutation basically is a copying mistake. It's a typo in your DNA. So one of those little genes has been switched. And suppose, uh, suppose you have a dog with uh, genes for four normal legs, which all dogs should have, but there's a mutation, a copying mistake, and so that gene doesn't get copied properly, and so you end up with a dog with short, stubby little legs because he, his legs didn't form quite properly because he's missing a little bit of information. And that's, that's key to understand. Mutations are really a loss of information. Now, if you think about it, dogs with lots of mutations like that would tend to be eliminated in nature, wouldn't they? A dog with short, stubby little legs is more likely to be killed off because he can't run and catch anything, and he's more likely to be, more likely to be picked off himself. But if you think about it, some people like dogs with short, stubby little legs because they can't jump up on you as much. And so people protect the mutations in dogs that they like. And they take dogs with short, stubby little legs and encourage them to breed with other dogs with short, stubby little legs, and you end up with lots of dogs with short, stubby little legs. See, that's how it works. And there are other mutations as well, of course. There's a mutation that causes the dog's snout not to grow properly, and so uh, you end up with a short, stubby little snout. And the skin was designed to fit the longer snout, so the skin hangs off the side. If you don't clean it, it can get infected. And some people like dogs with that mutation, and uh, I'm not one of them, but in any case. Uh, but have you ever thought about it from the dog's point of view? You think he says, gee, I love having my nose stuffed into my face. That's great. Not at all. Poodles. Let's talk about poodles. Look at all the different problems that poodles can have because of mutations that have been built up in their genome. There's a mutation that causes their fur not to stop growing. See, dogs are they're supposed to have fur that grows so long, but with poodles it can grow continually, and if you, if you don't uh, trim it, it can get in their eyes, and their eyes can get infected. They can have secondary problems because of some of these other problems in their DNA because of all these mutations, you see. So that's how you get these different breeds of domestic dog, just different combinations of genes and mutations <laughs> accumulating in the various dog kind. But it's not evolution. Because if you start with these more wild kinds of dogs, and through selective breeding, through natural and artificial selection, in the case of domestic breeds of dogs, you get all the way down to the poodle. But it's not evolution because we haven't gained any information. In fact, we've lost information. Those mutations reduce information, just as natural selection does. They eliminate information. You can think of information in DNA like jelly beans. And so you start out with the more wild kinds of dogs that have more information, more uh, possible traits. And then through inbreeding those dogs, 
you can reduce that information and through mutations as well until you get down to the poodle and then you have hardly any information left. You've got a <laughs> biological disaster on your hands. But if you think about it, could you ever turn a dog into a cat by this kind of process by losing information? Not at all, because a cat has different information. You can't turn one kind of information into another by losing it. It doesn't work that way. So you see, evolution can't work by natural selection and mutations. You can see that because th those processes only reduce information, whereas evolution is about an increase in information. So when we take a look at dogs in the world today and we watch how they reproduce and we see dogs giving rise to dogs, we're applying good operational observational science in the present. We find that it's consistent with what God has said in his word. That, that animals reproduce after their kind. It's consistent with creation, but it's really not consistent with what you'd expect from evolution, where we would expect an increase in the information content in the DNA. By the way, it's important to point out that mutations can be beneficial by losing information. In other words, a mutation could help you survive, but it's still not evolution because it's not adding any information into your DNA. And as an example of that, consider wingless insects. Suppose you have insects on an island that's very windy, and they tend to be flying around, they tend to be blown off into the ocean, and they die. Well, suppose that there's a mutation that causes their wings not to form properly, and so they can't fly around, they can't be blown off in the ocean and die, they're more likely to reproduce, because they're landbound. That would be an example of a beneficial mutation, because it helps the organism to survive. But is it evolution? Well, no, we've lost a structure, we've lost the information for wings. It's a reduction in information, therefore the opposite of evolution. What about Antibiotic resistance. People talk about antibiotic resistance being an example of evolution. It's hard to believe, but really, it's the opposite of evolution. There are certain kinds of bacteria. H. pylori, for example, this is a certain kind of bacteria that if you introduce an antibiotic into it, it has an enzyme that will break that antibiotic down into a poison, and the poison will kill the bacterium. Well, there is a mutated form of H. pylori, and when you introduce the antibiotic into it, this particular mutation lacks the ability to produce that enzyme because he doesn't have all the information there. So he can't produce that enzyme that breaks the antibiotic down into a poison. So the antibiotic doesn't get broken down into a poison. It just stays in the system. And so he survives. But here's the point. He survives because of less information. And so then the, one, the normal H. pylori, they're killed off. And the, one, the mutated form survives. But, and it goes on to reproduce. And pretty soon all the bacteria are resistant to your antibiotic but it's not evolution because they haven't gained any information. They haven't gained a structure. On the contrary, they've lost information. They've lost the ability to produce that specific enzyme. Natural selection and mutations are in the wrong direction to make evolution happen. They're a downhill process, not an uphill process. And in fact, there's a scientist, Dr. Lee Spetner. He's a PhD biophysicist, and he says that all point mutations that have been studied on the molecular level turn out to reduce the genetic information, not to increase it. He says, not even one mutation has been observed that adds a little information to the genome. Mutations are in the wrong direction to make evolution happen. So when we take a look at DNA and we take a look at mutations and we apply good observational operational science in the present and we see how these mutations work, we understand that it confirms what God has said in his word. God made things perfect at the beginning and mistakes have accumulated with time, ultimately because of sin. God removed a little bit of his sustaining power. It's what we would expect based on the Bible, but it's in the wrong direction for evolution. It's not consistent with evolution. Well, let's talk a little bit about information science because I've talked about information. What is information? Well, you, you sort of have a feel for what information is. If you've read a book, you know that there's, in, in a book, it's got information in it because it's got a code system. If I pick up a book like the Bible, it's got you know, letters in it. It's got a word. Here's the word horse, for example, if I take a look at that word. And I, I understand that it's not actually a horse in here, but a, it's a code. It represents something else. It's a code system. There's a language convention. The language, this one is in English. There, you can get other versions as well. It has meaning. There are a couple of other levels of information too, but I want to keep it kind of simple today. But if you think about it, you, you sort of know what information is. Well, how, how do books get written? How does, how does this book get written? How does the Bible get written? How does any book get written? What if I had a, a magazine article up here and I'm reading that article? Where did that article come from? You might say, well, somebody wrote that article. And I would say, well, no, somebody didn't write that particular article. It was actually made by a machine that makes a lot of them simultaneously. And hopefully you would agree with that. Yeah, we make magazines a lot, you know, a lot of them at a time. Well, where did that machine get the information? Well, probably got it from a computer. Well, where did it get the information? From another word processor on another computer? It's probably been copied a number of times, hasn't it? If you think about it, mistakes would happen. Suppose I told you that the way articles get written, nobody writes them. But in the process of copying them, mistakes creep in 
and they add information to the article and make it better and better. That's how articles get written. Now, granted, most of those mistakes make the articles worse, but those we throw away. The rare mistakes that make the article better and add information to the article, those are the ones that we preserve, and that's how articles get written. There's no intelligence behind them. All that information came about as a collection of typos. Is that how articles get written? Not at all. And you all, you instinctively know that. You instinctively know some of the laws of information science. You know that information cannot come about by a sort of random process like that. It can't originate by itself in matter. It has to have an intelligent source, doesn't it? You know that an article can be copied many times. You know that mistakes can creep into an article. Theoretically, those, those mistakes could make the article better by removing something from it. Like maybe there's a paragraph that wasn't so good anyway and they remove it. Theoretically, that could improve the article. But they would not add information to the article, would they? These, those typos would not add information. Well, what if a paragraph gets copied? Do you have any new information? Could you read anything by reading the second paragraph you couldn't get from reading the first paragraph? You see, ultimately, you know that that information had an intelligent source. Information, even though it can be copied many times, ultimately comes from a mind. Every article you've ever written has a mind behind it. And that, in fact, is a law of information science. Dr. Werner Goetz, he's an expert on information science. He says, there is no known law of nature, no known process, and no known sequence of events which can cause information to originate by itself in matter. That is a theorem of information science. He says, when its progress along the chain of transmission events is traced backwards, every piece of information leads to a mental source, the mind of the sender. So when we trace back this copying process, an article copied from an article copied and copied and copied, ultimately, somebody wrote it. Ultimately, there is a mind behind it.